thank you so much, Lewis, for joining me today. I'm so excited uh, to have you here because it's it's just such a fantastic book that we're d- uh, talking about today and d- doing a quick introduction and then going straight into it. Um, so Professor Lewis R. Gordon is the head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut in the U.S., visiting professor of philosophy at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, and honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies. And we'll be talking about his latest book, Fear of Black Consciousness. Now, the book explores contemporary racism and the long historical movement from black consciousness with a lowercase b to capital B, black consciousness. So thank you so much, Lewis. Uh, you know, what thank is it? You, when we, it's it's so, so great to have you here. Honestly, I'm, it's so exciting. I'm delighted to be here. And, and thanks for that wonderful summary. Yeah, no, thank you. It's it's such a great book. I'm so excited. And so I just wanted to ask, like, what is it when we actually talk about black consciousness? What is that? Well, when we're talking about black consciousness today, we're primarily talking about a racialized consciousness, the racialized consciousness of people being black. That's the short, the very short version. And but of course, it's never really that simple. Sometimes things that seem simple, such as saying the consciousness of being black, we have to bear in mind that people can't be conscious of being black by themselves. So it's also the consciousness that people who are not black have about other people as black. So they also have a form of black consciousness, but it's not necessarily the consciousness of experiencing how one is treated as a black person. It's experiencing pointing to or identifying another person as black. So within that framework, we already see that there's a relationship that constitutes black consciousness. But we should add to that, that there are ways in which people could look at other people as say black or themselves as black in a way that has no um, harm or, or even valorization to it. For instance, what if a person were literally the color black? then that that just means the person is the color black. Just like if people were literally the color white, it would be the color white. But as we know, we rarely ever meet people who look like that. So usually when we're saying black and white, we're really putting uh, putting something onto people Mm -hmm. that's not exactly their color, but the baggage that comes with using the term black and white, the terms black and white. Mm -hmm. And the world we live in is a world in which, when pertaining to people, it is racialized. So we should bear in mind, first, that there were times where people talked about varieties of colors without any racial connotation. And part of it is because the concept of race didn't always exist, Mm -hmm. and the practice of race didn't always exist. Um, We don't want to get into danger of saying, if we don't have a name for something, it doesn't exist. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Yes. so, so there, there have always been people who treat people in valorized or prob- and problematic ways. But particular organizations of ways of referring to people in that what we call racialized ones, that actually came along when there needed to be a way of, of, of organizing right, systems, yeah. whether they are legal, moral, political, or even metaphysical to claim that out there somewhere in the world there's something in the flesh and in there, you know, the, the idea that there's some people who associate some people's actual skin with evil. That's kind of metaphysical stuff. Go so, ahead. yeah, so that's the first everyday mundane one. But we should bear in mind what most people will be listening are thinking about our actual history. So let me, let me just do it one more time in a very short way. There was a time when there were no reason in the world for anybody to think of themselves in racialized ways or think of themselves according to categories such as black, white, brown, yellow, Mm -hmm. red, etc. But because of historical circumstances of colonization, exploitation, etc., certain ways of looking at people, which for many people is primarily gendered, and even in societies that didn't use gender the way others use them, some societies, for instance, have seven genders. Some societies mm. didn't even think of gender but age. Some people thought of, there's so many ways we think of each other. Mm-hmm. But the society that produced the way we talk about racism and racialization 
uh, it uh, came from a way of looking at people that separated them fundamentally by gender. And the historical way was to say uh, fully developed people were men, people who were less developed were women. Mm. But then what do you do when you start now claiming that those people now meet other people who have people of different colors who could be called women and men? And so what began to happen is a realignment. So the, w the women and men in the dominating group began to change, and they began to ascribe what they used to ascribe to women to the groups they dominate. Mm. And that this is why I, always, I argue, as you may have seen in the book, that it's a mistake to separate gender and race, mm. but to actually see how they're part of an, a way that people organize thinking together. To put differently, I've never seen a race walking or a gender walking. I've always, <laughs> yeah. I've always seen an embodied constellation of race, gender, class, all kinds of things, orientation, etc. because that's what we are. So when we put it together, when we put it together, this problem emerged because at first it was what, and again, this is the pejorative way of looking at it, mm. the effeminizing of whole groups of people. So the women and men in those places were put onto a racial category that kept the, the dual or binary logic of the masculine is strong and the feminine is weak, mm. imposed that onto a people. And this, of course, creates a kind of identity crisis of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, because what do you do now if you're going to be calling, say, a white woman a man <laughs> yeah. just because of her whiteness? And this stuff, these kind of organizations of people then transformed people who were um, Palenci, Asante, Wolof, Luo, Fulani, Kokoyo, Oza, mm. Tswana, all these kinds of people, or people who could have been um, Pashtun, uh, Punjabi, yeah. Tamil. Mm -hmm. Loads of people suddenly were put onto the category black. And, yeah. um, and, and we have been struggling to work out that lowercase racialized blackness since. That's so interesting because, you know, th th this was a question that kept coming up whenever I read the book, which was, you know, and, and you mentioned it as well, which is, do you think it can cause like an existential crisis to think of yourself as like a body or a group, especially when people are like no longer indigenous? It does. But it the thing to bear in mind is when we say existential, mm. uh, uh, ex all existence means is to stand out. And when we stand out, that's how we're conscious of ourselves, how we realize the world. So humanity is actually uh, an existential reality, okay? Mm -hmm. But crisis is a little different. Right. Because, you see, standing out makes us take on a lot of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, if we use the biblical example, when, when, when the God figure says, don't eat from the tree of knowledge, uh, Adam and Eve began to stand out. They began to stand out because they realized, oh my goodness, I could obey or disobey God, God Almighty. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, the, the idea that they are responsible for that choice. Yeah. So, yeah. So at that moment, I hope to, I, in my, my interpretation, Eve is actually the hero or heroine of the story <laughs> because, because in her actions, humanity is born. Hmm. You see? Yeah. However, having a responsibility is scary. Everybody knows that who's a parent. You go, you take your kid to the supermarket or, or your brother or your sister and say, choose whatever you want. Look at all this stuff. <laughs> and the kid goes in a crisis, <laughs> right? <laughs> Choice is scary stuff. And so many people wish that we, we want to eat our cake and have it too, right? Yeah. At, at least when we're kids, when we make mistakes, we're not responsible. We can say, oh, you're a kid. Yeah, but mm. but it but this point at which we have to be responsible is scary for many people, and they wish for the old days when they could act without being responsible. So, but but that is never really our existence. So, mm. so on the one hand, even within the question of indigeneity and so forth, yeah, there are several crises to think about. The first one, if you're there in your country with your fellow folks. There's no relationship to say indigenous versus non-indigenous. Mm. 
So indi an indigenous identity comes from a disruption of the ordinary life of mm. the people. Right. The second thing to bear in mind is then what happens with that indigeneity? Uh, one, one could be racialized, one could be structured in ways that are subordinate, all kinds of other things. The next part is that we sometimes put too neat a narrative on what happens with traumatic encounters. Mm. So we, in other words, we think of conquer, conquered, and then the people want to go back to what they were. But that's not always true. Sometimes people in processes of uh, violence, conquest, colonization, and sometimes it's not necessarily brutal. Sometimes they have an internal debate. Mm. The internal debate is, do we want to go back to where we were? Yeah. Do we want to be like the people who dominate us? Or would we like to be some mixture of them? Or, e or maybe the, maybe this all is awful. Maybe we should try to be something better. You see where I'm going with this? Totally. And in fact, we've inherited a lot of that to this day. Most of our religions, that's the history of their story. Mm. Uh, this this weekend, a bunch of the Abraham, Abrahamic religions of course, uh, have, yeah. uh, have um, celebrations. But but they, they all go back to, um, you know, conflicts with different empires. You know, ancient Judea with Romans and, and the, Hellen the Macedonian empires and the Persian empires. And in every one of them, those ancient Hebrew people were arguing about whether they should be Roman or Persian <laughs> or Greek. And, and, and they created a hybrid, right, which we yeah. call Judaism. Mm -hmm. And even further back, when we think of ancient East African peoples, whether they're Aksumites or they're, you know, uh, they're going to be Kushites or they're going to be Kametans, or which we know today as Egyptians. Mm. Uh, they too went through all kinds of conflicts. And every time people meet people, the truth is something new always happens. Yeah, totally. And totally. the same thing when we think about Hinduism, and the same thing when we think, you know, about Persian people going to the Indus Valley and the mixtures there with Dravidian peoples. And mm -hmm. We think about Japan with the Ainu. I mean, there's so many examples that we could have a whole session just on that. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> but, but, the, but the main point is that those debates create something new, and those are those religions we have. But even with those, those religions are now meeting other things that are new, and they're connected to these ongoing conflicts. So the indigenous peoples may say, you know, um, we now live in a different world and we need to find a way to create new rules and ways of living mm. that can respect us as a people, but also understand that we are connected to, but we're not really like our ancestors. Mm. We're something new. And the world that we may create may make for our descendants a similar question. They may be connected to us, but they're going to be very different from us too. Yeah, definitely. And actually, you know, you were talking about responsibility. So how can we all be politically responsible? Um, because I feel like, you know, some of us, like there's a lot of uh, <laughs> the population that likes to shirk responsibility and believes it's just what one group's worth of uh, but it's, it's for everyone, isn't it? So how do we all become responsible? Well, the truth is we're all responsible already. Mm -hmm. It's more, I think it's a little different question, which is how do we come to admit our responsibility? Yeah, yeah exactly. And take, it, <laughs> and, and take it on, you know? Uh, because as you know, one of the things I point out in the book is a concept called bad faith. Mm -hmm. And bad faith is when we lie to ourselves. Mm. And we often lie to ourselves because it's difficult to deal with a displeasing truth. And one displeasing truth we just brought up, which is that we're all responsible for the world politically. We just all are. Yeah. <laughs> it would be much it'd be much easier if we say they're good guys, bad guys, good women, bad women. And there are. There yeah. are. Mm. But but that's more about more specific things. I was talking to you before we began recording about the difference between moral and ethical responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> versus political responsibility exactly yeah and legal responsibility and i was bringing up these are ideas talked about from people such as carl jaspers the great german thinker 
uh, from the 20th century, Hannah Arendt also from the 20th century, uh, an American feminist thinker, Iris Young. There are many people who talk about these. Uh, Frantz Fanon from Martinique talks about mm. this, and it informs a lot of my work. But the main thing is, is this. Moral and ethical responsibility is something that's specific to us individually. Mm. So if someone, if you're lying down and somebody didn't see you on the beach and stepped on you, right, you are individually harmed and that, indi per that individual stepped on you. Now, yeah. if the person said, well, I just to himself or herself or their self, well, I didn't see you, so just keeps walking. <laughs> You know, that person just, that's an individual. You may say, yo, yo, <laughs> right? Now, the person said, but I didn't intend to hurt you. But yeah, but the point is you were hurt. In that moment, mm. an ethical person says, the point is somebody was harmed and just says, sorry, right? The whole thing could be, and be like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on you, right? But yeah. that's still individual. But political responsibilities, that's very different. Mm. Political responsibilities are connected in it, uh, always, always beyond ourselves, all the way through, beyond, uh, through to people we even don't even know personally or contact, mm. and to be anonymous. They're connected to humanity. Some people in the past looked at them specifically with states. So you have political responsibility over your state, your jurisdiction. This is what, this is the, one of the problems we have right now with all these wars going on. Yeah. Because we live in a planet right now with nation states and or states that are basically saying it's their business, stay out of it. Mm -hmm. okay? But if we look at it metaphorically, this would be like if every individual were a state and if they're there, there or every household was a state and they're there like torturing the people in their household and, and they could just say, yo, but it's my household, stay yeah. out of it. It's, it's private, it's my business. Well, for the political world, it isn't. Mm. Uh, it's pretty clear when it's political responsibility, all of all humanity ultimately is responsible for it. Yeah. And it can go in several directions. One is the blame direction. We, and we know this, for instance, uh, if if a country uh, and this is why Jaspers was talking about if a country that has behaved badly loses. Mm. Everybody in that country bears responsibility for the acts of its government. Yeah, mm, definitely. But here's the thing. Um, we have to bear in mind that although we may talk about Germany in World War II or right now Russia, mm. or we may talk about Turkey with Armenians, or we could talk about what happened in Rwanda, the yeah. list is long, right? Or if we could talk about the various corporations and their link to the Congo. The fact of the matter is, the we I'm using there is all of humanity. Yeah. We have to say, what did we do, right? That's the blame part. But mm. there's another political responsibility. The responsibility is given the terrible things we're seeing. What are we doing to organize a world that could be better? Yeah. That could, and to do that, that means we have to think politically in a broader way. And this is where Iris Young's work is so important. Drusilla Cornell's work is very important. These are all, all a lot of my homies, my crew, <laughs> people that I talk with. And, and some of them are no longer alive, like Iris or mm. Fanon, you know, the people who are no longer uh, alive but had great insight. Yeah. And, and that is, and, 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 and as you know, when I, in the book, I don't only talk about philosophers and people. I also talk about everyday people. I talk about people like Harriet Bailey, you know, mm. Frederick Douglass's mother. Yeah, you know, amazing. Enslaved, yeah, she's amazing. Ama amazing. You know, everyday people. There are Dalit women right now, as an example, yeah. who are doing things that their names won't be known, but, no. but they're pol acting politically. Mm -hmm. When you act politically, you work with other human beings to expand the capacity, their, our capacities to, create, to make power transformative. In other words, it's the use of our ability collectively to, to enable power, to enable people to make their lives better. Mm. Uh, we use it in a bad way politically, ironically, through disempowering people's capacity to act politically. And so that, in other words, when we lock people into their bodies, when they're just in their flesh and that's all they could act on, that's disempowerment, but that's also oppression. Yeah. Oppression blocks our, our access to the social world 
that we call human reality. Mm. So political action increases our capacity to live in the human world. And that means everybody can act politically, whether it is the way we organize our neighborhoods, whether it's how we even use our technologies. What you're doing right now is actually political okay. because it goes, no, it is, it really is. It goes because it goes beyond you and me. It goes out to a world mm. who may find it useful. And it also goes out there. It can be used for ill or it could be used yeah. for good things. For, for instance, when we, when we think about what we're dealing with in the world today, if we commodify our political identity, if we look at political identity simply as a question for market exploitation, then all the only issue is, is, is the selling of our political identity. And that means that at that point, it can actually be an affirmation of a system of commodification and exploitation. But if we actually see the political work as thinking about what we can offer people that may actually enable us creatively and for them to add to it and transform the world, then ultimately, although there are efforts to commodify politics, mm. we, have, we have reintroduced the idea that political life is part of giving us the agency to evaluate the market, evaluate commodification, yes. and pose limits on them. Definitely. Do you know, it's a, this is a perfect segue because I was just about to ask, which is, as an ally or, or, or someone who wants to help advocate, how do we help bolster black power with a capital B? Okay, well, first I have to say what black power with a capital B is. Mm. Well, to think about black power with a capital B, first, let's go to the lowercase b. The mm. lowercase b occasions what's called double consciousness. And that's where you're black and you're aware that you're constructed as black and you're aware of how people see you as black and they may see it as negative. So that's when everything that's black is made into a problem. Mm. But people, but the thing we should remember is that everyday lowercase black people are human beings. Yeah. And so if we understand that they're human beings, it means that everyday black people get up in the morning and we live our lives and listen to music, have friends, you know, brush our teeth, try to make a living, you know, just live. But the world tells us we're a problem and that creates oppression. When you realize this, then you have this insight and this insight has been written about by Jane Anna Gordon and by Paget Henry and others. But Jane Anna Gordon is the person who formulated it this way. W.B. W. Du Bois thought about it, mm -hmm. but he didn't formulate it this way. And that is his Du Boisian one. Du Bois said, you know, wait a minute. There is a problem of a society making people into problems. <laughs> if you understand you are a human being, then you say, all I am is a human being who faces problems. Hmm. And when you think of yourself that way, you understand that problems can be fixed. Things can, you can do something to change the world. And at that moment, when you realize you can do something, you now have potential. So that means it's not that I'm endemically poor. It's a society that is structured to make me poor. Yeah. If I work with people to make things in such a way that people aren't poor, if I work against, it, it means I have to struggle for a lot of things, for equality, for clean air, mm. you know, the list is long. So at this moment, once you begin to realize there's something you could do, now you have a new double consciousness. It's called potentiated double consciousness. And that's what Jane Anna Gordon said, potentiated double consciousness. And potentiated double consciousness is what is called dialectical. Mm. And what that means is if you look at that first level, the first level is based on contraries. It's like segregation apartheid. So all things white are good, all things black are bad. Mm. Two separate worlds, right? But that's not the human world. <laughs> you, only, you, could, you could only keep that world that way if you keep people apart, if they never communicate, they never interact. And remember what we talked about earlier. It's impossible to interact with another human being without being affected. Yeah. In other words, human beings are relationships. So the first thing we know about that first example which is based on racism and segregation, all of that, is it is it actually is what Fanon called the murder of humanity. Mm. 
Because if you create certain people as superior, they're no longer human. They're above human. And if you create a group of people as inferior, you're denying them being human because you make them below human. Where are the human beings in that <laughs> scenario? So, but where human beings actually are, are all those things they're trying to prevent. Intimacy, communication, sharing, friendship, mm -hmm. society, all of that stuff's where human beings are. And that means those contradict those two universals. So it means human activity is always bringing out the contradictions that universal are, are universalizing. You notice that's different from universal. And that means we're always expanding our possibilities. Mm. So that's the communicative stuff. And that's why potential is there. Well, at that moment, when you realize your potential, mm. then black changes from lowercase b to uppercase right. b black because you're now an agent of history. But mm. now here's the interesting part, right? Because you would think that's interesting, but that's mm -hmm. not the real interesting part. The interesting part is all along, I've been talking about the suppression of our humanity. So the uppercase B one cannot work if it asserts itself as a complete, closed, superior, agent of history blackness. Mm. It is actually an affirmation of our humanity as potential, which means it is always in relationship with many things that are not black. Mm. You see? Yeah. It means it has to deal with our engenderment, our sexuality, our creativity. The, lo the list, again, is long. Yeah. But that uppercase B, black consciousness, through uh, um, addressing the closed notions, means that it's communicative, it's relational, mm -hmm. and it means then that it is fundamentally democratic. Yeah. So let me give a concrete example. When the um, extraordinary creative women of Black Lives Matter mm. uh, founded their movement, they did not know they were extraordinary or creative. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> they were just, they just saw themselves as a group of queer women who were activists dealing with certain issues. And they were just tweeting and doing what people do. However, a huge responsibility fell upon them and they took on like Harriet Bailey. Yeah. I, I made a connection between the two and, but there are many others, Sojourner Truth. They're all the way through to Angela Davis, all the way Definitely. through to the many people we can talk about today. What they understand is that if you're fighting to empower the humanity of others, if it, you're dealing with things greater than yourself, then you're ultimately fighting for the public emancipation of power rather than the privatization of power, hmm. which means you're fighting for democracy. So when those people attacked those women and said, all lives matter, the fact is those women are saying black lives matter because they because, believe all yeah. lives matter. Mm -hmm. And they're acknowledging that a lot of the world was built upon saying some lives matter more than others. What black lives matter is about it's to say, you have to put it on the table, to say then you're fighting for democracy in all lives. It's just like if one is in, in South Asia, to say Dalit lives matter is to say we're in a society in which not all lives are mattering and we yeah, gotta absolutely. do something about it. Yeah. Same thing that we would have to do for Ainu in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, you notice in the book, I never talk about blackness in a reductive way. There are people who always no. think their they're blacks are the blacks. There's some people who actually are pissed off at me when they read the book because they just want to hear <laughs> that black people are only U.S. black people or black mm. people are only South African black people or black people are only black Brits or black people. No, 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 no. Once we admit that black people are created or produced, anybody can become black people. And that's what's happened historically. Mm. So, and, and some people stop being black people, but the point, but that doesn't change the issue of the commitment that we have, the, the point is, is not whether there are black people or white people or brown people. The real issue is, once you say there is a given set of people, how do we treat and live together with those people in a world of respect and dignity? Yeah. And, and that requires people who are designated as those people 
being able to live and participate as human beings with dignity and respect. So ultimately then, this is why I say right in the book, in the book chapter, black consciousness is political. Mm, yeah. Because political, the way I argue political, is also what the world of power is in human relational terms. Hmm. Definitely. Definitely. I'm like, it, that's definitely the feeling I got when I was reading it as well, which is it's so much more. It, it's, a, it's like individual, but greater. Um, and, uh, you know, it, obviously I've got to... I've got to ask you about all those references uh, to all the pop culture because it is incredible to reread and rewatch all of those things like after reading your analysis on it and being like, oh yeah, I did know. <laughs> Suddenly I noticed oh, something different. Yeah. And um, that was really interesting because like obviously you mentioned quite a few, but you know, Black Panther and Get Out and, and you know, I found also the myths behind them absolutely intriguing because just never knew anything about the history so how do we get all you know an all-round understanding of what we watch and what we consume when we don't have the full context of things ah well that's why we have a conversation like what you and i are having now this is why we write books that's why we make documentaries etc the idea is we have to meet people where they are and work with them from there. But we also have to do it without arrogance. Mm -hmm. So for instance, one of the things I do when I write and when I teach is always remind myself that I'm a student. Mm -hmm. Writing for me is a process of learning. And when I work with my students, once they realize that I consider myself a student, sure, I, an advanced student because I studied many things, but they have also, they know things I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so once we learn that we're learning together, we now can meet each other where we're at and go further. So if we get into what you're saying in the book, you may notice I never say as a philosopher, as a sociologist, <laughs> or as yeah. I, I don't believe in that stuff. Uh, everybody can learn. So the first thing is we have to just face facts. Many people uh, either are not reading as much as they used to. Mm -hmm. Or even when they're reading, they're not necessarily, not many people have the time to go learn ancient languages and know all the myths, etc. I usually make the joke that whenever my kids used to watch film with me, they, were, they thought I had some magical power because three minutes in, I'm like, oh, I know where it's going. And they're, <laughs> right? and they're like, shut up, dad, shut up, shut up, don't talk. <laughs> and, they, right? and, and they don't realize it's not like some kind of Sherlock Holmes skill. It's because I know the myths. I know the stories. In fact, we are creatures of stories. We've been, our, we've been telling stories for hundreds of thousands of years, and, and other hominins had their stories that may have been shared with us. And stories that are useful for us, we retell. We retell these stories. So because I know the stories, I could recognize the characters. Mm. And so it's, uh, I have to, there's nothing special in me with that. It's okay, but here's the thing. Uh, People are now telling stories that they don't realize are retold stories. Mm -hmm. So at least it makes more sense if I'm going to engage an argument mm. to start with a story that I know a lot of people have seen. Yeah. Mm. If, ne if nearly a billion people have seen some yeah. of these movies, <laughs> yeah. then at least an eighth of the planet, I can, can know where the story begins. Mm. And some people misunderstand when I talk about films. I don't always talk about films I even like. <laughs> I talk I, I talk about films because people have seen them yeah. and that enables us to have a conversation. The zeitgeist, uh, yeah. Yeah, Jamaica Kincaid put it this way when she and I were in a conversation. She said when she read the book, she said, oh, Lewis, I realize you're not trying to please the reader. You're trying to engage them. Mm. And, that, yeah. and that was a very astute observation. So Indeed. here it is. You could start with a film and once they see the film, they, you know, the, the, the arguments, you know, then when you then I could introduce them to the story, the myth the film is based on. Hmm. And once they see it, they begin to realize, oh, and this may draw them to have a new understanding of a film. This is probably your experience, as I mm. yeah. to told the myths. But then the, I point out that all myths are also based on myths because mm. the whole premise of a myth. You see, the mistake people make is people think a myth is about what it's 
is fictional or false. Mm. No, myth is not about truth or falsehood. Myth is about meaning. Yeah. The word myth is from the word mythos, which means from the mouth, told mm. by mouth, right? So it's about storytelling. And if we don't have meaning, if things aren't meaningful for us, then they don't have an impact on us. There's nothing we can do. I mean, it's just there. We're just staring at it blank, dead. But if we can see the connection it has to us, the meaning it offers, yeah, then we could go further. And what what I ended up doing, I'm also you could see you could probably guess inviting people to take it on their own, to have their own agency, and bring their understanding of how to read and understand these phenomena. Because you see, if racism, sexism, and all forms of oppression are dehumanization or practices of dehumanization then we're ultimately, or, and practices of disempowerment, then we're actually fighting for empowerment that takes the form of humanization. Hmm. But that means we have to answer the question, what, is, what does it mean for us to be human beings? What is our humanity? And these are about things we share. And to put it bluntly, it's about living meaningful lives. Yeah. But when we say meaningful lives, it means we have to understand how these myths work. So some people may be shocked to see in the book that some some films that they would just think of in ordinary critique of capitalism mm, and so of forth course. turn out to be retellings of Pinocchio. Yeah, I was so shocked when you said that. Huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you find out that Pinocchio is also a retelling. <laughs> Pinocchio is a retelling also of another myth, which is the golden ass. Oh, yeah, right? exactly. By Apollius. Yeah. And then you find out that the golden ass is a retelling of an ancient <laughs> myth. That's an ancient because ass in in um, ancient Greek is onus, and onus, like today, the, is the, we know means burden. Yeah. And then you find out that the people who had domesticated the donkey were ancient East Africans known as Kemetans, or we know today as Egyptians. So then we realize all the way back in that past. The creator beast of burden continues wow. to this day, which is why we tend to, we, we can, in film, by turning people into donkeys, mm. are actually telling the story of slavery. Interesting. And, and there are many others, you know, when I talk about the chicken in the city of God. Yeah, and, um, that was really interesting. Yeah, I was just like, I remember that film and I didn't even think of it from the perspective of the chicken. Being yeah, there. or even yeah, or even in Black Panther, the fact that uh, Najada or Killmonger, his suit actually was a cougar, not a cougar. I'm sorry, a jaguar, mm. right? Right, like a black jaguar, and as we know, jaguars are in the Americas. Yeah. So it's an interesting symbolism, right? That he is not going to look like an actual, you know, what people call so-called pure African creature, mm. black. Yeah. Because right? all Black Panthers are, are black leopards. Hmm. Right, but they're not leopards in the Americas, right? No. They're cougars and uh, and you know mountain lions, jaguars, bobcats. So it's a very interesting thing to pay attention to in these, wow. how myth plays itself out in these, and there are all kinds of others because, as you know, when I talk about the Black Panther, uh, some people again, and it's tricky because some readers and some listeners sometimes also their anti-Semitism come in. Oh God, yeah. Because, yeah so, so for some people, just knowing that the original character is created by two Ashkenazic Jewish guys automatically makes it bad, and they miss the point because I point out that Judaism has its foundations in East Africa and West Asia. Yeah, totally. So in their effort to talk about Africa in the language they knew, which was Judaism. Uh, was actually African since Judaism came from Africa and yeah. West Asia. But but if we go and look at the the deeper African stories, all the way back, for instance, to the story of Isis, Horus, and, you know, Isis, Osiris, and yeah, Horus. Yeah, that was a horrifying story, but yes. <laughs> it is. We begin to see, right, that it makes sense, isn't it? Mm. If we're all ultimately connected, if all if if if, if our ancestors all go back to Africa, mm. of course African myths are going to make their way into what we do today. Absolutely. Ancient African myths, mm. and similarly, uh, and who knows what myths we might have inherited from our Neanderthal cousins and Benusaban cousins and so forth. But they're part of the stock of what we are, and but they but 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 there there's an insight. Because what I do love about that Isis, 
Osiris Horus story, it connects to the political story we're talking about, mm. which, it, which is that if we keep trying to repeat things for their authenticity, we, we do not adapt to our new environment. We don't change. You see? And one of the problems we have today, we have many problems, but among them is we keep trying to, trying to resolve 21st century problems hmm. with 19th, 18th, 17th century solutions. Interesting. And, and ways of organizing the world. But those immediate ancestors lived on a different planet. You know, um, it used to take three years with a good ship to go around the planet Earth. Mm. Today, if you can't get to the other side of the Earth within 24 hours in a plane, we're pissed off. <laughs> and uh, or if we can't talk to somebody the way you and I can right now, even mm. though we're great distances away, we are frustrated. Anybody could tell you when space and when you can traverse a great distance quickly, the distance shrinks. So we, we, humanity in 2023, we live on a smaller planet. And we need to understand that we need to cultivate values for what it is to be living as a compressed species mm. on a tiny, tiny blue dot with very limited oxygen. We need yeah. to develop some new values. And what I like about that ancient story is that my point is not for us to repeat that story. It's for us to learn from it. Hmm. And what that story revealed is finally people had to develop something new because Horace came out of water instead of out of soil. Hmm. Right? The, I'm sorry, Horace, yeah, because Osiris, was yeah. Kept, he kept being dismembered and put into soil. Well, similarly, in Black Panther, all the previous Black Panthers were resurrected through soil. Yeah. But finally, somebody broke from it and was resurrected through water. Yeah. And water, a feminine symbol, which is very crucial because up to that, it's very masculine. It's a male, you know. Mm. Or And as we know, in the comic books, the next Black Panther is female. Yeah, the, uh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And so... And in, 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 in a lot and in a lot of ancient African myths, they're very different from European myths, you know. Many European myths, the sky because it's upper is masculine and the, the soil because it's beneath the sky is feminine. But in ancient Africa, the soil was masculine mm -hmm. and the sky was feminine because it was saying at a valuative level, woman were woman was on top. And the <laughs> reflection of and the reflection of woman was water. So she was both on top and on the side. And that's a very different relationship to what we call women today. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And so this question of being reborn in an androgynous way, right? The new T'Challa that came out was actually, and a lot of people don't get this, was actually male and female. That's so interesting. Yeah. And, and you see the political decisions. The political decisions was not to be an isolated male anywhere anymore. Con Remember, the thesis of that film is to address the false dilemma that Killmonger played. I mm -hmm. mean, placed. The false dilemma is conquer or be conquered. That's the very masculine-centered view. But there's another consideration. What not, why not, if you have to fight, get rid of conquerors and conquered? Why not fight for something different? Create something that belongs to all. And yeah. that's the back to the political yeah. humanity part. And that's why it's crucial in that film, which is, although he went to the UN at the end, uh, he did go to the projects where Killmonger was from. Yeah. And he showed, he showed the technology to children. Why children? And that's back to potentiated black consciousness. Because yes. children have potential. Mm -hmm. They have possibility. And, and that's a leap of faith. So, I mean, my point is, in whether, whether the movie, whether people like the movie or not, mm. the point is what can, in our contemporary political debates, we learn about the past, the present, and the obligations we have to come through engaging these kinds of discussions. It's fascinating. Like, you're really fascinating. I was just like, like, my mind was blown. I was just like, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, because uh, I've seen Get Out like four or five times, honestly. And, um, <laughs> and honestly, and 
you know, I, I think it's weird because each time I find like I see something new, you know, um, and uh, but this time was a whole other, you know, kind of, you know, way of looking at it. But it was great. And I'm conscious of the time. So uh, I don't want to oh, take well, up too much of your time. N- no problem. But given what you just said, there's something I'd like to say. You give Please me do. an opportunity with what you just said for me to say, I don't only always say that I consider myself a student and student working with fellow students. But I also always say that nobody has ever really read a book or seen a film or listened to a song. What people actually do is we are reading a film, I mean, reading a book, listening to a song or seeing a film. And that's why every time we go back, we see more. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you really do. Like, and I w- that's why I wanted to end the, the you know, this uh particular session because I don't want to take up too much of your time but I had to ask which is is art ever free from political and economic forces then as like Nietzsche had said so would you is it always influenced the answer is I think even more radical it's not so much that it's influenced or it should be liberated or free from it it actually is always an expression of all the facets of our humanity. The mistake people make is they want to put art to the side and prioritize politics and morals mm. and other things. Yeah. But when we do that, that's that compartmentalizing that actually is part of the dehumanizing process. Mm. Art is the production of our livability. And our livability means that it's always already infused in our politics and our morals <laughs> and our food and our nutrition, etc. Human beings don't live in in little openings or hovels. We live in spaces we change into places. That's why we decorate. Yeah. That's why we change the, the, the ambiance. That's why we create homeostasis. Well, it's the same thing with societies. We're always actually producing, a, working at uh, what I call... Uh, the livability of the human condition. Mm. And if you think about it, we if we get a whole lot of things we want, you know, our economic stuff together, all of these things, and we took art out, our aesthetic dimension, you'll have a whole bunch of human beings just walking over a cliff because we would have created, we cre- would have created a world that nobody could live in. Yeah. So, for, so, so the world of art is linked to the world of meaning. And so for me, art is necessary. It's not, it's not about a, um, a narrow functionalist thing. It, we are the expression of art. And, and, and when you think about it, we spend a lot of times looking at each other, listening to each other. Most human life is devoted to human stuff. Mm-hmm. And what art is, is part of that human stuff. Mm-hmm. that reflection that enables us to think and opens up our possibilities definitely oh god yeah that you know the whole sort of chapter on blues music and ch- jazz and stuff it just kind of pierced something in my heart because it's very it's really personal to me I, I, you know that kind of music it, re- it really speaks to me a, a lot so yeah i'm glad to i'm glad to hear and i i share cloud levy strauss's view on technology when I talk about art, which is, you know, there are people who may wonder, you notice I go from Euroclassical through to blues, through to hip hop, to reggae, to samba. It's not to to show off, so to speak, my my range. It's because all are art. Mm -hmm. What Levi Strauss said, whether it's a stone axe, a steel axe, or today a laser that you cut through a tree with, they're all axes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, similarly, they're all art. Mm-hmm. And they all do what art's supposed to do, yeah. which is they remind us that we live in a human world. Mm. That's, yeah, it's so true. That's so true. Oh, God, oh, I could talk, you, talk to you forever. Um, yeah. Well, uh, likewise, I'm enjoying the time with you. Yeah, no, it's uh, so, so fascinating. God, I was just like, oh, this is just such like 
these subjects are so important I find like you know and we are still working towards so much um so that's why I was just like this is like the perfect piece of literature in this sort of zeitgeist so to speak um to try and move this forward really um so thank you so much for sharing this with the world and talking with talking with me about it I really appreciate it oh well thank you so much it's such a pleasure honor privilege you know for me the word privilege has a different meaning in the book enjoy (laughs) 